Hi everyone. Today's presentation covers the topic of proteins. Proteins are polymers made out of a smaller subunit called an amino acid. Uh, so an amino acid is what we refer to as a monomer. When you put together a bunch of monomers, you do get a polymer. Uh, there are 20 different amino acids that can make up proteins. Now the basic structure for an amino acid, the generic structure, is as follows. We have a central carbon atom, which is always bonded to a hydrogen. There is an amine group, NH2, and there is a carboxyl group, or a carboxylic acid, COOH. Uh, the other part of the structure for an amino acid is an R group. An R group is a location where we have the possibility for different things to be inserted onto the amino acid structure. And I'll show some examples of R groups on the next slide. This slide shows a number of different examples of amino acids. For example, here we have glycine, alanine, valine, serine, lysine, tryptophan. Uh, in the proteins that are found in our bodies, there are 20 different amino acids that are linked together in chains to make up those proteins. Let's take a look at a couple of these different amino acids to find the generic um, parts of their structure. So let's look at asparagine right here, ASN for short. We can see the central carbon is right here. Bonded to that, we have the carboxyl group or the carboxylic acid, COOH. We have an amine group, NH2. We have a hydrogen. And this is an R group. This is, again, a place where we have variation from one protein to another. Uh, compare that to glutamic acid. Again, a central carbon, a carboxylic acid, an amine, a hydrogen, and an R group, which is slightly different. Um, comparing all of these different amino acids, we can see in blue on all of them is highlighted the R group. And this is, again, a region where there's going to be variation. Every single amino acid that you're looking at here will contain an amine group, a carboxylic acid, and a hydrogen bonded to that central carbon, and then an R group also bonded to that central carbon. Levels of protein structure. I'd like to remind everybody that this was covered in greater detail in the organic molecules lecture, so please refer back to that. Uh, some reminders, the order of amino acids in the chain is going to play a major role in determining the shape. The chains are going to have twists called alpha helices and folds called pleated sheets. Um, the other things that we would consider uh, in thinking about the structure of proteins is that some proteins may have multiple chains. Uh, this is referring to the quaternary structure of the protein. Um, and a reminder that shape is very crucial in determining the job that a protein will do. The images on the bottom of the slide are two different ways of representing the protein insulin. Uh, this right here is an image showing the sequence of amino acids in the two different chains. Uh, there is an A chain and a B chain in human insulin. Uh, so we can see on the A chain we have glycine, isoleucine, valine. Uh, so we have a sequence of 21 amino acids in the A chain. And on the B chain, uh, again, we have a sequence here of 30 different amino acids. Uh, the overall structure of the protein is perhaps better captured by this illustration right here, um, which is showing us uh, the different components of the A chain and the B chain um, and how they would come together to form the overall quaternary structure of this protein, which, of course, serves a very important role of helping to regulate blood sugar levels in our body. Proteins perform many important functions within our bodies. Many proteins are enzymes which are going to help to uh, allow chemical reactions to occur within our cells. There are other proteins which have the job of controlling cell processes. Other proteins in our bodies make up important tissues, for example, muscle. There are other proteins which are going to be responsible for moving things either in or out of our cells in order to have our cells maintain homeostasis. And then there are other proteins which help to fight disease. For example, the antibodies that our bodies form if we've been exposed to a pathogen. All in all, our bodies, uh, the best estimate is that they have approximately 100,000 different kinds of proteins performing all these different jobs in our bodies. And I think that that's truly amazing. Let's consider a little bit more information about enzymes. 
Enzymes are proteins which function as catalysts, which means that they will help chemical reactions to occur within our cells. They do this by lowering the activation energy, which is startup energy, for chemical reactions to take place. Think about a match. A match is not going to start burning all on its own. You need to strike it. That's the activation energy or the startup energy. What the protein catalyst will do is they'll make it easier to get a reaction started. This is an example of a chemical reaction which is catalyzed by an enzyme called catalase. Uh, in it, the reactants are hydrogen peroxide. We see actually hydrogen peroxide is shown twice in this diagram. Uh, as catalase breaks, helps to break down the hydrogen peroxide, the products that are forming include water, H2O, and oxygen gas. Let's take a closer look at this reaction by sh viewing a short video. The contents of this test tube uh, include originally hydrogen peroxide, which is a clear liquid, was placed inside of the tube, and then a small piece of liver. Now the liver is actually a tissue which contains a lot of catalase enzyme. Let's push play here and we can see uh, as the reaction progresses that there are lots and lots and lots of bubbles being generated by this reaction process. The bubbles are evidence that oxygen gas is being produced. Uh, left behind in the bottom of the test tube would be the water, which is the other product of this particular reaction. So again, what we just saw refers back to this particular chemical reaction. Hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, was placed into a test tube, and then a small piece of liver was added. The liver contains many, many, many molecules of catalase enzyme. That enzyme is going to lower the activation energy, allowing the hydrogen peroxide to actually break apart, forming water molecules and oxygen molecules. And the oxygen molecules were evident in the video when we saw the bubbles being formed in the test tube. In this slide, we're looking at two different reaction types. Exothermic reactions are those that are going to release heat energy. Uh, we can also call these exergonic to refer to any type of energy being released. Exothermic would just mean actually the release of heat. Endothermic reactions are ones that will absorb energy. These also can be referred to as endergonic. Let's take a look at a diagram illustrating an exothermic or exergonic reaction. Please note that the reactants, the substrate, have a higher energy level than the products, the things which are made. This is because energy is actually being released by the reaction system. And we can see here in part two of this diagram that uh, an enzyme could help to catalyze the reaction and lower the activation energy. So here without the enzyme, we have a lot steeper hill to climb up. So there's a lot more startup energy required. Here, with the presence of an enzyme, the amount of energy needed to uh, get the reaction kick-started is a lot lower. Um, here, we're looking at an image which describes a reaction where the reactants, or the substrate, is at a lower energy level, and the products are at a higher energy level. So this would indicate to us that the reaction process was actually absorbing energy and forming products which contain more energy than the reactants that we had before the reaction began. This slide shows a closer look at what is called the enzyme substrate complex. Now, please remember the shape of an enzyme determines the job that the protein or the enzyme is going to do. Um, in this picture, let's look at the following things. The substrate. Substrate is a reactant in a chemical reaction. Think about hydrogen peroxide from the demonstration. Uh, the enzyme would be the catalase. Uh, this was the protein that was found in the liver. Uh, we can see that the substrate it is allowed to fit nicely into the enzyme. This is forming what we call the enzyme substrate complex. Uh, when this connection forms, it's going to allow the connection between this portion of the substrate and this portion of the substrate, the green to the blue. Uh, it will allow that connection to be weakened so that it can be broken more easily than if, the, uh, than if the enzyme was not available to catalyze the reaction. Please note that the enzyme after the reaction is unchanged. It looks just like it did before the reaction process. This means that this particular enzyme could be used over and over again. It could be used many, many, many times. The speed at which enzymes will function or do their jobs can be regulated in several different ways. One way to have an enzyme work more quickly is to have more of the enzymes present uh, wherever the reaction is occurring. So they will work faster if they are more concentrated, meaning that there are more copies 
of that enzyme to help break down or put together whatever substrates they're working on. pH levels can also determine how enzymes will work. Uh, most enzymes are going to work within a uh, relatively small pH range, perhaps a pH of 6 to 8 is where most enzymes are going to work best. Um, other enzymes may work better um, in an acidic environment. Maybe some of the enzymes that are found in the digestive system where they're going to be exposed to more stomach acid would be examples of this. Enzymes are going to work faster as temperature increases uh, because particles are going to be moving faster. So the enzymes are going to find the substrates that they're acting on more quickly. There is a limit to this. If the enzyme is heated too much, then it can actually change shape. We call this uh, the process of denaturation. And if a protein denatures, if an enzyme denatures, its shape is going to be altered and changed, and then it may not be able to perform its function normally. It might not be able to perform its function at all. So if the temperatures go too high, uh, this could actually shut down the ability of an enzyme to do its job. Earlier in this presentation, we took a closer look at the structure of insulin. Let's now consider what's happening at the cellular level that allows the insulin molecule to help regulate the levels of sugar in our blood. So the target for insulin uh, is receptors on the cell surface. We can see the receptors shown here in red. Um, here we're seeing examples of the insulin molecule. So we can see that insulin has found a way to bind itself onto the receptors shown here. Uh, that are embedded within the cell membrane. This is going to uh, trigger a response within the cell for glucose transport protein, shown here in purple, to move to the cell membrane. This is going to open a doorway into the cell that glucose that's found in the bloodstream can travel through to go inside of the cell so that it can be utilized to get energy to power the cell. This is going to, again, move glucose from the bloodstream into cells. So this will effectively lower the amount of glucose that's in the blood. Uh, now, if somebody has diabetes, it can be for a couple of different reasons. It can be that the diabetic either lacks their own natural insulin or their cells have lost the ability to utilize insulin properly. And this is going to depend on the type of diabetes that the person has, whether they have juvenile diabetes or adult onset diabetes. Another example of a medically interesting uh, enzyme is called um, angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE for short. Uh, let's take a look at what the ACE enzyme does. This molecule right here is called angiotensin 1. This is a harmless chemical that's found in our bodies. Now, if ACE enzymes are present, uh, what they're going to do is they're going to snip angiotensin 1. So they can actually cut it. And uh, this will form. When the ACE enzymes cut angiotensin 1, it actually forms molecules called angiotensin 2. When these are being produced, it can trigger a raising of the blood pressure in the body. And we all know that this is not good for the person's health. So the goal is to try to regulate the blood pressure of these people. So the treatments that have been worked out for this are called ACE inhibitors. Uh, the ACE inhibitor, we can see here, it looks like a wedge from a piece of pie. Um, they've been constructed so that they fit very well into the active site of the angiotensin converting enzyme. Uh, when this happens, you're going to shut down the ability of the enzymes to cut angiotensin 1 molecules. Um, the more enzymes that you can shut down, the fewer angiotensin molecules will be cut to form angiotensin II molecules. Uh, so you are effectively going to be able to allow this person to regulate their blood pressure because we're shutting down the enzymes that are converting a harmless molecule into a molecule that does harm. Uh, the limits of this are whenever we're using a, an inhibitor to shut down an enzyme, we cannot shut down the enzyme at a 100% rate. Uh, the best we can do is to try to shut down most of the enzymes. Um, so this is going to, again, allow for the person's blood pressure to be regulated. To close, I thought I would show one more example of a protein. What we're looking at here is an animation of the protein hemoglobin. What we're seeing in dark blue is the alpha-1 chain. In light blue is the alpha, uh, the, sorry, the beta-1 chain. In green is the alpha-2 chain. And in yellow is the beta-2 chain. So there are four different uh, amino acid sequences that make up this particular protein. Now I'll switch our view so that we can see the heme groups. So we're highlighting those in red, and we can see in the center of them is an orange 
iron atom. And this is actually what's responsible for holding the oxygen.